Welcome everybody. Today we're going to talk about our extra lecture number four and it's all about triple differences. We took a while to prepare this lecture and essentially the reason that we took longer than I was expecting it is that that is to my surprise although triple differences it is very popular in the empirical literature there is very few papers out there talking about the foundations and how to do how to actually leverage triple differences in a reliable way. So to, to deliver this lecture at the level of rigor and transparency that we are doing in our entire course, I have to derive a lot of new results and I hope with all my heart that you're gonna enjoy this ride. So today in this extra lecture number four, we're gonna be talking about triple differences and we're gonna start with the very simple case when I have two periods, then you're gonna talk about the situation when I want to allow for covariates as well, then you're going to consider the case with several time periods and with and without covariates, and you're going to end this lecture with a staggered adoption with any four covariates. So everything we have seen in the main course, right? So two periods, two groups, like the case with several periods, two groups, staggered adoption as well. We're going to see all that today, but in this like modification of the difference and difference setup, what is called triple differences. Before going there, it's worth it to kind of like zoom out and think about what we have been seeing in this course like throughout this last month or so, right? We have seen many different facets of difference and differences. We have seen differences and differences with and without covariates. We have seen differences and differences with two time periods or several time periods. We have seen and talked about differences and differences with staggered adoption with and without like covariates. And overall, regardless of the facet of difference and differences that we have seen in the class, right, all this somehow relies on us first fixing the target parameter. Once we fix the target parameter, we're gonna somehow impose identifying assumptions. And in general, this is gonna be like parallel trends, a version of anticipation behavior, Right, no anticipation, R ruling out some types of anticipation. We're going to impose no spillover, sutva, right, and common support. And once we have all that clear, we show that we can actually estimate, recover different versions of some average treatment effect among some printed units. Right, so overall, the, at the heart of difference and differences, it is that we're going to end up comparing units who have been exposed to treatment with units who have not yet been exposed to treatment or have never been exposed to treatment. And regardless of the facet, these comparisons, this is all about difference and differences. This is the fundamental point of difference and differences that we have covered in this entire course. But this is important because in general, we're gonna compare one group with another group, and we're gonna be relying on a parallel trend assumption, right? But so far, we haven't really talked about triple differences. And if you open the empirical literature, it is very common to see like triple difference here, triple this is there, right? As a robustness check or sometimes as a main specification. And what I wanna dive in today, it is how we can leverage our knowledge, our building blocks, the first principles we have been pushing through the entire course to tackle triple differences. Make sense? So that's what we're gonna be doing in the next one hour and a half or two hours today. So it's interesting to talk about triple differences, right? You have to like, well, find triple differences, right? And I get the name, I have heard it before, but what is the setup? What is the framework? What we're gonna be actually be doing here? So we're gonna start as usual with a, the simplest case as we can, right? Here is gonna be the setup when I have two time periods only, right? We're gonna have before treatment and after treatment. I'm gonna have and different units. You can think about units being people, right? So individuals, like I have N of them, two periods before and after, and usually when I hear periods T equals to one, when I be before, periods T equals to two is gonna be after. And somehow to make things interesting, now units gonna belong to different set of quote unquote states. Here I'm gonna denote the states with the little like letter S, and these two different states, set of states they can belong to, it is set of states with little s equals to infinity or set of states with little s equals to two. Think about, st here states are just a generic term, 
right? And it can be in states, it can be counties, it can be individuals, it can be like, individuals it cannot be, it has to be a collection, a more aggregate level than individuals, right? So here, little s will play a similar role as our little g that we talk about throughout the entire course, right? So here in x, little s will index the date in which treatment started at this set of cohort of states. Right? And within each set of these states, so in s equals to infinity, little s equals to 2, we're going to be able to partition the population into two additional groups. Right here, we're going to have a group L equals to A. You think about the other group is going to be L equals to B. So think about age profiles. L equals to A is going to be somehow like younger folks or male. L equals to B is going to be like, I don't know, people with between 20 and 40 years old, female. Right? So any type of like partition of the data that we are able to do right, within each set of states, this is going to be play the partition of L. And why am I doing this? Because the setup of triple differences share some similarities with the, with the with traditional diff and diff, but has some like unique features. And the unique feature here is that, like before, in period one, nobody's treated. But in period two, like states who belong, units who belong to state S equals to two, right? The states who actually enable this policy in period two, not everybody they're gonna be affected by the treatment. Only units who have party in the partition L equals to B gonna be affected by the treatment, right? So if you are in state S equals to two, but you belong to the partition L equals to A, you will remain untreated. And that's the main innovation here compared to the traditional diff and diff, right? because even within the states that adopt the policy, the policy is not meant to affect everybody, only a subset of the population, and this subset is going to be denoted by L equals to B, and here B stands for benefited, as the subset that benefited, that was affected by the population. So in order to make these things, this discussion more concrete and more potentially more intuitive, let's go back to the like founding father of triple differences. But to the best of my knowledge, triple differences was introduced for the first time in the literature by Gruber in this very influential paper of 1994. And the main idea of this paper, it is to like study states, right? To study if, if a state pass a mandate in which it stipulates that from that point onward, childbirth gonna be over comprehensive in health insurance, right? If I want to see like then these mandates that now for now onward, childbirth gonna be covered in health insurance. If that's gonna affect like hourly wages for women who are in the childbearing age, and the idea here is like well now that insurance gonna have to cover childbirth, right? Employers gonna the price of insurance gonna gonna increase potentially. Like employers gonna have to pay more for the insurance, and there is gonna be a, like a, a transmission of that effect from employers to employee, and the employees here who are affected by this policy is gonna be women, right? So we wanna know if this if there is this pass through, right? And if the passage of this law actually affected like hourly wage relative prices for women. So here. How do they gonna do? What is, how, how crew, like how Gruber leverage this particular design? So he had data from CPS, right? So data on individuals. We're gonna have data before this policy implementation, right? before the state mandates, so T equals to one. And also gonna have data for after state mandates, T equals to two. And we're gonna have two different sets of states. Some states who have passed the mandate, S equals to two, and some other subset of states in which do not, have not yet passed the mandate, S equals to infinity. And so I'm gonna have two different set of states, those who have the policy, those who do not have the policy. Right, but remember, this policy, like childbirth, like this maternity mandates, maternity benefits mandates, only gonna affect 
woman, right? Because here, woman is a population of interest because men cannot have, like, cannot give birth, right? So what is gonna happen here is that we're gonna partition my data, right, into two groups as well. I'm gonna have, like, married woman with age 20 to 40. This is gonna be the, quote unquote, the target population, the population which this policy is supposed to directly affect. And I'm gonna have a, dish, a different partition of the data, right, which is gonna be S, uh, L equals to A. And L equals to A in this study, it is individuals who are older than 40. It can be men or women. And also among those who are between 20 and 40, we're gonna have single males between L, like 20 and 40. So we essentially partition our data into two groups, woman, 20, 40 years old, all individuals older than 40 and single males between 20 and 40. We have these two groups. Now these people live either in a state who adopt the policy or in a state who do not adopt the policy, right? So S equals to two or S equals to infinity. And I have data on before the treatment, before this policy was enacted and after this policy was enacted. So you see, this is a, essentially the components of a triple different setup. But in order for me to be actually treated, I have to satisfy two criteria. I have to live in a state who enacted the policy, right? And be, belong to a given partition of the data in which this policy is actually affected. In this case, I have to be a child, a woman with childbirth age. Right, so essentially, whenever we're gonna hear about triple differences, we're gonna have this set up in our minds, right? So in order for me, to be exposed to treatment, I have to satisfy two criteria. Be in a state in which this policy is enacted and belong to this partition of the data in which this policy actually is, you are eligible for the policy. That's the idea. So as we know, right, we are in this new setup, right? It shares a lot of flavors of differences and differences but we have to be very clear about what is our potential outcomes, what are our parameters of interest, because that's gonna guide us through how we should proceed with our analysis. So we're gonna now dive deeper into potential outcomes and parameters of interest to make sure we are all on the same page, we, rule, like we put it forward, all the rules of the game, so we know which game we are playing. Here, we're gonna adopt a very similar notation as we have done throughout the entire course. But so we're gonna talk about potential outcomes and potential outcomes gonna also be indexed by the time a policy is enacted, right? So we're gonna have potential outcomes here gonna be indexed by little g. And remember, little g here is the date in which a unit it is first treated, right? So we're gonna denote y sub, sub, subscript i t in parentheses g this is gonna denote the potential outcomes for unit i, individual i, in time period t, right? If this unit is first treated in time period g. Right, so that's the potential outcome we have discussed in the entire course, same thing over here. What is interesting? Well, g here, we have only two periods, right? So we have only two groups, right? Groups here in the timing of treatment. Either you are exposed to treatment in period two, or you're not exposed to treatment by period two, because in period one, nobody's exposed to treatment. So little g can be two values. It can be equals to two, or it can be equals to infinity. And this is where the things get interesting here in the triple differences, because units who live, who are part of a state S equals to two, right, and they have they belong to this partition B, right? These units are actually exposed to treatment at time two. So these units are gonna be our treated units. And so if I am a woman, right, married between 20 years old and four years old, and I happen to live in a state in which has enacted, has passed these maternity mandates, right? I'm gonna belong into the treatment group. Everybody else, gonna belong to the untreated group, right? Because the policy do not affect anybody else. Those units are all untreated. So here, 
in order to have little g equals to 2, in order for you to be actually treated, you do have to satisfy two criteria. You have to live in a state which has passed these mandates and belong to the partition right, of the population in which this policy is targeted. In this case, L equals to B. Right, so for units who are treated in time G equals to 2, we're going to observe Y2. Right? For units who are never treated here, right, because we have only two time periods, we're going to observe they're going to have G, little g equals to infinity, and we're going to observe Y infinity. Right, so very similar here, potential outcomes are going to have the same notation, the same terminology as we had throughout the rest of the course. Right? We have done this for, like for, I don't know, 15 lectures already, more or less. Here, same thing. But now, in order for you to actually be treated, you have to satisfy two criteria, and before was only a single criteria. That's the caveat here. That's the difference. Right, so since we are, have the same potential outcome terminology, right, this satisfying two criteria is a, very, is a very minor tweak, it makes sense that at the beginning, we're going to be talking about exactly the same type of parameters of interest, right? We still want to care about the average treatment effect among the treated, which is written as the average, the population expectation, right? At time period two, at time period post, right? From switching treatment date from never being treated to being treated in period two, among units who are actually exposed to treatment among units who have g equals to 2. But it's like, Pedro, why g equals to 2 here, right? Why? So, because g equals to 2 are the, the subset of units who are actually exposed to treatment. And in our example, right, in this context, who have g equals to 2, right? You're going to have g equals to 2 if and only if you happen to belong to a state which has s equals to 2, to belong to a state in which has passed this mandate, right? And at the same time, you have to belong to the partition which is affected by this mandate. You have to belong to partition L equals to B, right? So you're gonna have G equals to two if and only if you are in, state, in a state who has passed this mandate and you belong to the target population of this mandate, L equals to B. So by doing this, right, we're gonna somehow drop this g equals to 2 and more or less highlight it that we got, whenever we're talking about average treatment effect on the treated, we are talking about the average treatment effect among units who live in the state with s equals to 2 and are part of the target population, l equals to b. So this is the average treatment effect in time period 2 among units who are treated in period 2. And who are these units? Those are the units within the state of set of states with s equals to 2 that belongs to the partition l equals to b. So that's going to be our parameter of interest. It's still the ATT, right? And again, we're starting from the very basic setup when I have only two time periods and only two sets of states. In the context of Gruber, right, the founding father of triple difference, what is an ATT here? So ATT is going to be the same notation, same terminology, definition, when we express the ATT in potential outcomes. But the English explanation, right, so the policy relevance explanation, the kind of question that Gruber is trying to answer, right, it is, he's, he's looking at the data, looking at this design, and asking, what is the average treatment effect of state maternity mandates, which is the policy of interest, right, on hourly wages, which is my, my my outcome of interest in post-treatment periods, right? So what is the average treatment effect of state maternity mandates on hourly wages in, after the policy was implemented among married women who has between 24 years old, 40 years old, which is L equals to B, who happens to live in the states who has the maternity mandate by period two. So S equals to two, right? So this is like essentially, I wanna know among married women who live in a treated state, what is the average return effect of the state maternity mandate on hourly wage for them? And that's the idea of the ATT in this context. 
very similar to the ATT in a standard difference and differences. Now, but now it's kind of like conditioning on belonging to this partition, right? L equals to B. Good. So I say, well, Pedro, this is intuitive. This is interesting. How can I just map this into what I have covered in the course? In other words, can we just like get this setup and throw back at the two by two DID and see how we can go? My reaction to that is that, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's see how far we can go with that kind of idea. Let's see how much legs this idea has. So the easiest way, right, given our setup to proceed in this manner, it is like, well, I have those who, I mean, I have too many moving parts over here. So I have states who are treated, states who are not treated. Right? So I have states who have adopted this mandate and a state who do not have the mandate. So, and within each of these states, I have those who are targeted by the policy. So woman, married woman, between 20 and 40 years old, and I have the other units who are not part of this po the, the target population for the policy. So I have these two criteria. You know what, Pedro, what I'm gonna do? It is, I'm just gonna dump my data from states who have not yet passed the law, right? So I'm gonna just essentially get the data from everybody who lives in an untreated state, poof, dump them. So how does this gonna help us? Well, if I drop the data from untreated states, I'm still gonna have two time periods before and after the policy, right? Now I'm gonna have only one state, right? I have only a single state because I dropped the other, one, one of a single set of states at S equals to two because I'm dropping the set of states who have S equals to infinity. Now, within the state that I kept, right? I still have two partitions of the data those were the target population for the policy. In our example, by, from Gruber, 1994, married woman between 20 and 40 years old, I have the population, and I still have the other partition, right? The other partition, in this case, is everybody who is older than 40, and single males between 20 and 40. I can keep those as well, right? So I have two groups, like L equals to A and L equals to B. Nobody started in period one, that was the design. And now, among the units that I have kept in the data, you are treated right, in period two if you belong to partition L equals to B, right? And you are untreated if you are in partition L equals to A. So you see what I just did? Now we don't, I mean, once we drop data from untreated states, we are back to the two by two DID because I am treated if and only if I have L equals to B among the states who are actually treated. So in this case, it's just a matter of like changing notation, but instead of calling G equals to two, I call L equals to B. And we know how to do this game, right? It's just like we have been trained on playing around the notations, the semantics and all that kind of stuff. So once we drop data from unprinted states, we are literally back to the two by two case. And of course, by now we are experts in difference and differences. We are experts, especially in two by two DID. So we say, yes, fine. I can make it happen. I can actually run the code, right? I can implement this idea. But then it's like, well, if I do this, am I gonna be in trouble, right? And in order to answer if you're gonna be in trouble or not, we have to be clear with what kind of implicit assumption this procedure is doing it. Right, so here, what are the first implicit assumption we are making? Well, as usual, right, now to do diff and diff, like triple difference, diff and diff, or any type of things, and especially the, when I have only two periods of data, we're gonna be making a non anticipation assumption. I right, tell them like, well, in period one, nobody acts on the knowledge that a treatment is gonna happen. So in period one, states, units, individuals, do not act on the knowledge that this state is gonna pass a maternity mandate in the near future. So before the mandate is active, nothing happens. That's our non-anticipation assumption, which is, well, 
as long as the policy is not ad announced well in advance, this is a pretty reasonable assumption in this context. What about our parallel trends here? Right? So because when we talk about differences and differences, we always going to be somehow invoking a type of parallel trends. And once I drop data from untreated states, right, I'm kind of making a parallel trends within treated states only. And the type of parallel trends I'm going to be making here reads in the following manner. It reads that within this set of treated states, the average evolution of untreated potential outcomes, it is the same between units who belong to partition A and those who belong to partition B. Right? Essentially, I'm saying that like, if there was no maternity mandate, there was no policy intervention, right? the average evolution of the outcome of interest, in our case, hourly wages, would be the same if you are married woman between 20 and 40 years old and the same as if you were older than 40 or if you are between 20 and 40 single male. And I look at this and say, well, Pedro, you know what you just did? You're telling me that the, evol the average evolution of the earnings, right, of the hourly wage in this case, between married woman will be the same, and married woman from 20 and 40 years old will be the same as the other partition. And who is the other partition? People who are older than 40. So see, there's a different age profile. Or if they are from the same profile as me, they're going to be a different gender. So in order for this kind of partner trends to be actually valid and plausible, we have to rule out like gender specific trends, right? So the evolution of male is similar to the evolution of female. And at the same time, we also have to rule out age specific trends, right? Because somehow I'm telling you that the evolution, if you're between 20 and 40, it is the same as the evolution of earnings if you are older than 40, right? Somehow combined, not very precise, but you get the gist here. So in order, if I drop treated states, right? In this particular application, right? Uh, so if I drop untreated states in this particular type of triple difference setup, the difference and difference that I'm going to be doing it, I'm going to have to impose arguably very strong assumptions, ruling out gender specific trends and also ruling out age specific trends. And here I cannot condition on those variables, right? Because if I, con if I condition on age or if I condition on gender, this fully determined right, my treatment status. So if I, if I know your gender and if I know your like age, I can tell you, you're gonna be treated or you're gonna be untreated. So incorporating gender and age as covariates in my diff and diff, not gonna help me here because I'm gonna violate the common support assumption. Right, so here, if I end up dropping treated states, untreated states in this triple different setup to do different diff with the, with the framework that we have, we're gonna be making potentially strong assumptions. And it's like, yeah, I don't like this. This is potentially restrictive, right? Can I do something else, right? Can I do something else that is still like leveraging our DIDs, uh, our knowledge of DID? Can I still do something related to this, but allowing for gender specific trends and allowing for like age specific trends. Can we do something else? The answer is yes, we can do something else. Right? So instead of dropping data from untreated states, now I'm gonna keep that. I'm gonna keep data from untreated states. And now, because I wanna map this setup to a standard diff and diff, I'm gonna have to drop somebody else. Who is somebody else here? I'm gonna drop the data from the partition which has L equals 2A, for the, so I'm going to essentially only keep data from units who belongs to the partition of the data in which is targeted by this policy adoption, right? So by dropping units with L equals 2A, the unaffected units, I'm going to be back to the diff and diff 
two period and two groups case. Why is that? I'm still keeping data from period one and period two, right, so I keep that. I'm still gonna keep data from two groups, groups S equals to infinity and group S equals to two, right? Everybody in my data who belongs to group A to L equals to A, I'm dropping them. So that's not a mean. So essentially everybody has L equals to B. Nobody's treated in period one. In period two, among the units that I kept in my data, you're gonna be treated if and only if you have, if you happen to live in the state S equals to two. So essentially, I have to just relabel G by S and we are back to the standard diff and diff case with two periods and two groups. And again, to understand if this is something that we want to do it, right, we have to somehow highlight the assumptions, right? What is implicit behind the scenes over here? The first assumption that is implicit behind the scenes over here, it is the assumption of no anticipation. Again, this is the same as before. It's telling like, well, units do not act on the knowledge that truth is gonna happen in period two before it happens nothing really changed over here, and we're gonna actually embrace this assumption. What about the type of parallel trends assumption we are making over here, right? So in this case, we are dropping beta from partition A. So I'm the only, what I'm doing here, I'm making a parallel trend assumption within partition L equals to B. Right, so how I'm gonna, what does that mean? It means that like within units who have this given type of characteristics, right? Within units, in this, within the set of units who have L equals to B, the average evolution of untreated potential outcomes, it is the same between units in treated states and in untreated states. So essentially, I'm telling here, like among women, let me do this. This is the third bullet point over here. So among women, right? who has 20 and between 20 and 40 years old, right? the average evolution of hourly wage will be the same regardless if you live in a treated state or if you live in an untreated state in the absence of the policy. Right? So here what I'm telling you, if you, be, if you have to live in a state who have enacted this policy, right? and you happen to live in a state who have not enacted this policy, right? In the absence of this intervention, in the absence of this maternity benefit, right? I'm gonna tell you that the evolution of earnings, the average evolution of earnings will be the same among married women between 20 and 40 years old, will be the same. So what we are ruling out here, I'm using states, units, who happens to live in an unfriended state as a comparison group for units who happens to live in treated states. So to do this comparison, I have to rule out state-specific trends. Right? Because if I know your state, I mean, I, I'm using untreated states as a comparison group for treated states, and this comparison group, this kind of like control code imputation from untreated to treated relies on ruling out state-specific trends or state-specific shocks, if you may. And here, we have to stop and think about it, right? Is this a plausible assumption, right? Is it plausible to assume that, I don't know, suppose here, this is big, big suppose, I mean, I don't remember the details of Gruber 1994, suppose states like, I don't know, Massachusetts have passed this law, but Tennessee have not passed this law. Should I use the evolution of earnings from people in Tennessee who are married, woman has between 20 and 40 years old, to the same sub population in Massachusetts? Is that a reasonable? In the absence of policy, these two labor markets is still a very different. Right? So here we have to say, yeah, not really sure if I want to do that as well. Right? So so far, so this is still tricky. And why I'm stating this? Because Given the triple difference setup that I, we have presented to you, given this group 1994 setup, right? If we try to drop some groups and map 
it back to a standard 2x2 DID, right, we are essentially imposing potentially strong assumptions. Right? And the beauty of triple differences it is that we don't have to do that. Right? We can move on, we can move forward without having to drop this one group of units. Right? And by keeping everybody in our data and playing around with an alternative estimator, if alternative estimate, alternative set of assumptions, we're going to be able to allow for some types of state specific trends and some types of age and gender specific trends. Right? And this is going to be the appeal of triple differences. So we're going to be able to somehow relax some type of assumptions that we were making before, right? To and leverage this very specific setup, this very specific scenario, when I have to satisfy two criteria to be actually to actually be treated. So this is the triple differences coming for the rescue. This is what the heart, the appeal of triple differences. Right? And the idea here is like, well, I want to allow for location-specific shocks, so, so to state-specific shocks. At the same time, I want to allow for partition-specific trends or partition-specific shocks. I think about gender and age-specific trends. I want to allow both things happening at the same time. Of course, this is not magic. I'm not going to be able to allow for arbitrary like state-specific trends and the, it's going to interact arbitrarily with gender and age-specific trends. I'm not going to be able to allow for that because that would be too much, too much heterogeneity that data by itself not going to be able to pin down what is your ATT. So you're going to impose restrictions, right? So as you guys are already aware, causal inference is all about imposing restrictions that is meaningful to your own set of applications. So here, how are you going to make triple difference fly? What kind of restriction are you going to have to impose? The restriction you're going to impose over here is like is to assume that the difference of the average untreated outcome among units in partition A and partition B in treated states 2, right? So this difference between these two partitions in the state S equals to 2, it is the same as the difference, right, in the average untreated outcomes among units who have who belong to partition A or belong to partition B, but happens to live in untreated states as they go to inferiority. Right, so what I'm saying here is like, well, the quote unquote violations or the, the heterogeneity, right, between these two groups, the way these partitions, right, would evolve on average differ in the same way in the treated states and in the control states. Right, so that's the idea here, right? I'm gonna say, well, the relative growth of the outcomes between units in partition A and in partition B, it is the same in treated states and untreated states. Make sense? So we're gonna formalize this idea this power of assumption mathematically, right? Because it's all about how a difference of the growth, right, in two groups compare across different states. Of course, we're also gonna make a non-anticipation assumption, and I'm highlighting the non-anticipation assumption here again, right? Because we're gonna be, since we're trying to leverage timing as a variable over here, we're gonna act, we're gonna have to rule out anticipation behavior. So again, as before, no units act on the knowledge of treatment date before treatment started. No anticipation, we are keeping it. What about this, the type of parallel trend assumption we're going to be making in triple differences? What is it? How it looks like? And here, it's going to be that the difference of the evolution of the average untreated outcomes among units in partition A and in partition B Right, so the difference of the evolution of the average hourly wage between woman married 20 to 40 years old and those who have who are older than 40 or single males between 20 and 40. So how these two groups 
the evolution of the earnings differ between these two groups, it is the same in treated states and untreated states. So there is some kind of, kind of like a bias stability assumption here. So the violations of parallel trends, like between partitions, it is stable across states, right? Across subset of states. It doesn't have to be exactly the same in its states, but it's the same among treated states. And you average across untreated states, this difference is washed out. And that's the idea over here, right? So what I have over here is like, well, average, here what I have, the average evolution, oops, average evolution of untreated potential outcome among units in treated states and in who belongs to partition B minus the average evolution of untreated potential outcomes among units who happens to live in treated states and belongs to the unaffected partition of the population. So this difference, it is the same as the difference below and the difference below only changes the state. Right, so in our application right, of Gruber, the founding father of triple differences, this assumption implies that in the absence of maternity mandates, the difference of the evolution of average hourly wage between married women with 20, between 20 and 40 years old and all individuals over 40 and single males, right? It is the same in treated states and untreated states. So this assumption imposes the differential average trends of untreated outcomes between treated and untreated target populations, it is the same across states who implemented the policy and states who have not enacted the policy. This seems more plausible than the assumptions before. We are not ruling out gender-specific trends. We are not ruling out state-specific shocks, right? But we are allowing them to happen in some way that it's stable across two groups of states. And that's the gist of triple differences, right? So this is going to be the assumption we're going to make, right? This is the assumption we want to impose. This is how we want to relax the, the previous assumptions of before. And at this stage, what do you do? You look at me and say, yeah, this makes sense, right? I like this assumption is more plausible. At least it sounds like it, right? Before I know how to do diff and diff, this assumption, it is a triple difference type of assumption, right? Because I have two differences in the top, two differences in the bottom of this parallel trend assumption for triple differences. So it is a differences of diff and diff, right? So, but how I can use this to actually learn about the ATT, right? How can I actually use this structure to come up with an estimate, right, to come up with a formula that I can use data to move forward. How am I gonna move, how am I gonna do this? And this is the kind of steps that we have been doing it in this course many times, right? We have started this game of seeing how assumptions help us uncover what we care, identify what we care since lecture two. So if you, this is a good opportunity. So, so you go there check our slides, lecture two, slide 28, and say, yeah, I remember, we did this for the simple two by two case. And uh, what I'm gonna advocate for you now, let's do this again. Let's embrace the same kind of game and see how our assumptions are gonna come up with an estimate, right? How our assumptions are gonna help us identify what we care. And again, here what we care. We care about the ATT, and because G is equals to two, you're treated if and only if you belong to state two and you belong to the partition B. Right? So this is a bit, and you, you're only treated if you satisfy these two criteria. Right? So just leveraging Sutva, I'm not writing Sutva all the time in my assumptions, just because it's kind of repetitive, but we are always imposing Sutva behind the scenes over here, right? So. We have this ATT, I have a green term, because among units who belong to the set of states S equals to two, and who belongs to the partition L equals to B, I do observe their 
treated potential outcome in period post. I do observe that. However, for this same set of units, I never observe the untreated potential outcome in period post. So I'm going to have a red term and the game we're going to be playing here, it is how our assumptions would allow us to impute this red term. Cool? And that's essentially what we're trying to do over here. How our assumptions, Sutva, non-anticipation and parallel transfer triple differences help us recover this red component. And we're going to do this in a step-by-step -step manipulation, little by little, to get exactly what we want. Cool? And again, the structure we're going to follow, it is the same structure as we did in lecture 2. We did similar steps in many other lectures as well, in lecture 6, in lecture 8, exactly the same type of behavior. So, as usual, how are you going to start? So I'm going to just jump into the math, right, walk you through the mathematical steps, which I like this part quite a lot. And it's not only because it's math, because this is kind of like using like the first principles to see how assumptions help us recover our functionals of interest, how assumptions help us identify what we care about. And I'm trying to hammer this down over and over and over because I feel that once you see these first principles being applied, you can apply to so many different applications. You can come up with so many different ideas that this is my main goal here, to give you the tools that you can like, run by yourself, you can fly by yourself, apply this to the many different setups. Cool, so what are we going to do? We're going to essentially assume, we're going to start by rewriting what we care about, but we're going to rewrite our main assumption, which is parallel trends over here. So first block here, I'm just rewriting parallel trends as we have in the previous slides. Right, so we're gonna rewrite, oops. So I'm gonna write parallel trends as you have in slide 16. And once I have that, I'm gonna show you how this assumption help us moving forward. So what is the first step? Break that down into different pieces. I'm going to exploit the fact that expectations are linear operators. And once I expect, once I leverage that information, right, once I know that expectations are linear operators, I can play around. I'm going to have the red term, the red component, which is that component that I'm trying to impute here in slide 19. I color code it. I'm going to isolate that component on the left equation and everything else is going to be on the right. Right, so that's what I do in step number two, I isolate what I'm trying to impute on the left-hand side and everything else I keep on the right-hand side. So just simple manipulation, shipping all the terms on the left-hand side of this equation, number one, that is not red to the, everything that is in the left to the right. So you can isolate what we're trying to impute, what you're trying to identify in other terms. So this is essentially step two, right? We did exactly the same steps in lecture two, right? When you're trying to identify ATT in a simple two by two diff and diff. Here we are in triple differences, but the foundations, these steps are very similar. So we do this, fine. Then what I'm gonna do next? I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna look at each of the subsets, right? So I'm gonna look here to each of the subsets so S2 and L equals to B, S2, L equals to B, right? I'm going to look at the, sub, the conditioning sets. I'm also going to look at pretreatment periods, at the timing period here of the potential outcomes to see how I can use no anticipation to further simplify this assumption, this expression on the right-hand side, right? So that's what I'm doing over here, right? In this slide 21, and in slide 21, I'm going to leverage no anticipation. No anticipation is going to be helpful because for the first term on slide 20, what I have? I have untreated outcomes in period pre among units who are actually treated. But because I am in pretreatment outcome, I can manipulate this index here subset from infinity 
to two without losing much gener without generality because I, I can leverage the no anticipation. Right? So here what I have, I came up by no anticipation, since we are in pre pre period, I can have this guy here, right? And then I can manipulate. Make sense? That's what I have over here, right? And that's the idea. Oh, I have a typo over here. This should be L equals to A. This should be L equals to A over here as well. So I have B, B, L equals to A, L equals to A. So this also implies that there is a typo in slide 20. So this term here is A, this term here is also A, and this is important. Right? Because this is I fi I'm fixing this typo here in slide 21, right? Because if I belong to the partition S equals to 2, the state's 2, and I belong to the partition B, I am treated. So I have G equals to 2. Right? So G equals to 2, it is the same as the condition is as the potential outcome index. Right? So G equals to 2 is match the 2, match the 2. So this means like on the sutva, I'm going to be able to get rid of this potential outcome. I'm going to be able to write the potential outcome as realized outcome. And here, because I have S equals to 2 and L equals to A, right? even though I am in a treated state, I don't belong to the partition that is affected by the policy, I, I am untre untreated. So I have G equals to infinity. So again, infinity maps with infinity. So I'm going to be able to apply sutva to map potential outcomes back to realized outcomes. Same thing here, same thing here, same thing here, same thing here, same thing here. Right, so once I have this, like I am mapping whatever I have in parentheses, the potential outcome notation, it is matching the condition is set in terms of G, this let us, right, exploit sutva, which we are always imposing here under the hood, right? This is gonna give us a formula, right? Whatever I'm trying to learn, average untreated potential outcome in period post among treated units, I can actually leverage the parallel trend assumption we are making over there to write this counterfactual measure, right? in terms of things that I do see in the data. I have data in pre-treatment periods, right? I have data in post-treatment periods for the outcomes. So I'm gonna have now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms, seven expectations, right? That I can construct to and combine them in this particular way that is implied by our parallel trends. And by doing this, I'm gonna be able to identify the missing counterfactual. Good? And what are these partitions, right? So essentially what I'm gonna have data, it is, I have data in states, right? You either states, set of states two or set of states infinity. I have data in groups, uh, in partitions, either in partition A or partition B. And I have data in time, either in time one or in time two. So I have three different categories, right? How many partitions I can make with three different categories? Eight, right? So two to the power three. So I can slice these three groups in eight different ways, right? One of these different ways that I'm actually is doing it, it is this first component that I have here on the right-hand side in slide 19. The F, so I have outcome units who belongs to Post who are in the post treatment period, S equals to two and L equals to B. That's one of the partitions that I can make of my entire population, of my entire data set. Well, I have seven others. What are the seven others coming? They are all coming here, right? The seven other partitions are all coming here on slide 22, and we're gonna use all those seven other partitions in this particular way. So I'm gonna, some of these partitions I'm gonna add, some of them are gonna subtract, and how do I know which one add and subtract? How we came up with this particular expression? We walk through all the steps that our parallel trend assumption here in slide 16 is imposing. So once we do that, all these manipulations, right? I can plug in that term, right? 
So I can go back here, see the red term. Replace this red term from slide 22 back to the red term of slide 19. I can do that. Right? I'm going to get this ugly expression here in slide 23. So the ATT is going to be the average post-treatment outcome among units who live in the state who enact the policy and belongs to the subpopulation that is meant to be affected by the policy. That's the first term. Right? Minus, I have here in parentheses this combination of terms which are going to serve as the counterfactual average in post-treatment period among those units who are treated in the absence of treatment. And what is this? This is the average, right? So this, this operations follow this particular form. What I have done in this slide is to color code the terms, right? So every term here, every condition is set is color coded. So I have something in pink, something in blue, something in orange, and something in a different tone of, of like red, right? Because I'm going to group this conditioning terms together. So I have four different types of conditioning sets, right? And this is interesting because it's going to allow me to simplify my notation. So by grouping together the same terms, who have the same color, and distributing the minus term in front of the parentheses, I get this type of expression for our triple difference estimate, which is what is inside the first bracket here. I'm going to have only units in the state who actually enacted the policy. So this is the average post-treatment outcome of interest among units who belongs to the treated state and belongs to partition A minus the average pre-treatment outcome for the same partition. First, this is one difference, right? So this is like after minus before among units who are in state 2 and belongs to the partition B. What is the second term in the equation? I have average post-treatment outcome among units who belong to treated state, S equals to 2, and belongs to state to partition A. I have this term in post, I have this term in pre. So I have another post minus pre here. So what I have done here, this is a diff and diff, like among units who actually are part of the treated state. So the first key here, what I have, it is a diff and diff among units who are in treated states. Now, from that, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna subtract a term, which is the second key here, which is gonna mirror the first term, right? And again, I have a typo over here in slide 24. This is S equals to infinity, S equals to infinity, because this second block here, what I'm doing it. I'm looking, I'm mimicking the same diff and diff as the first key, but now among untreated states. So I do like after minus before among untreated states and unit in partition B minus after minus before among untreated states in partition A. So triple differences under these assumptions no covariates, is nothing different than the difference of two different diff estimates. How do we know that? Why do we get that? We get this from first principles. We got this step by step from our formulas. And that's the key, right? So under no anticipation and under parallel trends, the one that we made here for triple differences, by subtracting these two differences and differences, estimates among treated states and untreated states, I'm going to be able to uncover to identify the ATT. And that's beautiful because it's super simple to implement. Right? So even though this is the difference of two diff and diff, right? each diff and diff do not have a causal interpretation. Why is that? Each component of this diff and diff 
do not have a causal interpretation because the parallel trend assumption we are making does not allow us to interpret each of these components as an ATT for a subgroup, right? We are making a single parallel trend for the triple differences, and for that parallel trend, that's the only assumption we are making, so we cannot give causal interpretation to the first difference of these triple differences, right? So this, the, each of these bracket terms, so this term over here and this second term over here should not be interpreted causally without strengthening our assumptions, and that's important for us. So even though we arrive in a situation that to get this triple difference estimate, we are doing a difference of two DID, each of these DID do not have causal interpretation because our, the assumption that we are making, this triple difference is part of the assumption we are making it, it is not strong enough to allow us to attach a causal interpretation to each piece. This is important, you should not forget it. And why this is interesting? Why this is cool? Why I'm highlighting? Again, there is a typo here in slide 25, write this. These terms here in blue should be S equals to infinity. I'm going to fix this slide, this typo, and I re uploaded this mistake in the members area, so you should remember that. So, again, why this is cool? Why this is interesting? Because everything we have done so far give us a formula, a map, on how we can proceed if I give you data. So we have, we have shown that we can actually identify the average treatment effect among units who are treated in period post using parallel trends and strong overlap. But identification is step number one. Now I have to map those terms that I got in the previous formula to the data. And to do this, we're gonna talk about estimation and inference, right? And again, simplest way possible to do this is like, look at this slide 25 and say, well, it's just a bunch of averages, right? So what I do not know here, I do not know population expectations, but we all know a very good estimator for population expectations, sample means. So what we're gonna do to estimate the ATT, we're gonna replace each of these expectations by a sample mean, and again, this is the brute force triple difference estimator. Right, so the sample mean here is gonna depend on different indexes, different partitions, right? So it's gonna be like state specific, so this S is specific, partition specific L, and time specific T. So once I fix little s to a, little l to b, and little t to j, I, I compute the sample, I, I filter the data among these categories, and I compute a sample mean. That's what I have this y bar, is the sample mean of the outcome y for unit in the set of state s, with l equals to b in p to j. So the intuition and the obvious estimator that builds on our identification results, it is what I call this triple difference brute force estimator, where it's just replacing population expectations with the sample analogs. So I do a DID by hand among treated states, then I do another DID by hand among untreated states, and here when I say I do DID by hand, I'm gonna pretend in quotations that treatment status, it is the same as partitioning L, I say if you belong to partition L, you're treated. If you belong to partition A, you are untreated. Right, so I do this for states A, for states S equals to two, same for states S equals to infinity, subtract one from another, and chanan. We got a triple difference estimator. Very intuitive, literally, difference of two DID estimators, right? Super easy to do. Sample means everywhere, very interesting, very appealing. But then what comes? You look at this and say, yeah, Pedro, this is intuitive, but can I use a regression to do this? Right, so before, in the canonical case, in the, two, in the DID setup, we are able to use regressions to, to a fixed effects regressions to do diff and diff without covariates. Can I use similar tricks 
to run this as a regression in a triple difference framework, but because I like regressions, because then I can leverage standard errors, I can leverage my favorite statistical software, I can move along and, I mean, we are social scientists, right? We do like regressions a lot. So can I fit this estimator into a regression? And the answer is yes, we can, right? And this is very simple because our, there are eight possible partitions of the data we can actually partition depending on time, we have two periods, depending on states, we have two set of states, and depending on partition, we have two partitions, A and B. So I have, I have eight different types of subgroups I can compute, right? And regressions are great for computing averages for us. So if I have a regression who have eight parameters that respect these eight groups, I can manipulate them well enough such that one of these coefficients is gonna give me this triple difference estimate, right? And what kind of interaction we're gonna do here? So this is gonna be like very similar to the two-way fixed effects regression we had before in the two periods, two groups case, the canonical DID. But now, perhaps I should call this three, instead of two-way fixed effects, three-way fixed effects. Because what we're gonna have, we're gonna have like a state dummy, right? We're gonna, we're gonna first have a state dummy. We're also gonna have a partition dummy, right? We have here partition L equals to two. And we're gonna have a post-treatment dummy. Now what are we gonna do? We're gonna interact the state gummy, dummy if it belongs to the treated states, right? With the partition, right? So we're gonna interact as well the state, treated state dummy with the post treatment dummy, and we're gonna interact the partition dummy with the post dummy. So by doing this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six coefficients plus the intercept. So I have seven, what is missing? What is missing is this triple interaction of state, treated state dummy, treated partition dummy, and post-treatment dummy. And we can show by doing simple manipulations that the coefficient beta zero here in blue, right? It is equivalent to our triple difference and difference, the triple difference estimate right, in the canonical setup when we assume parallel trends as we have done it and no anticipation. And as I said before, the intuition it is that there are eight possible partitions in the data that we can make at the group level. There are eight coefficients in this regression, so the problem is just identified. Once I have this identification, it's just a matter of like rearranging these terms in the way we want and this particular specification does exactly that. And once we have this specification, what can we do? Well, throw this at your software. Estimate your beta zero here. Put a hat on the beta. The hat on the beta gonna give me, is going to be numerically the same as the hat on your theta here, the theta triple differences, DDD. And we like this because now, as long as we have many clusters, Inference is a standard, so we can leverage this regression specification, right, to construct confidence intervals, to so do inference, p-values, and all that nice stuff that we usually do when we run regressions. Cool, this is gonna be standard, of course, if I do not have many clusters, if I have very few clusters, this is gonna be more complicated. All the problems that we discussed in lecture three, when I come back, and here it's important to highlight that issues with a small number of clusters are more popular here. Because before I have only four partitions, I have two groups, but I have four groups, right? So more slices, more partitions of the data, but more subgroups of the data we have, smaller number of clusters for each of these subgroups. And issues with a small number of clusters are gonna be here everywhere. And we know Right, whenever I have few clusters, what we can do, the choice of the clustering level really matters, right? So the way, if I, cannot, if I, do, if I have only few clusters, what I do, I, I condition on these shocks, and I usually view these shocks as a threat 
to our identification results, to the parallel trends, and then you can do sensitivity analysis, leveraging this very great paper by Rambachan and Roth and that is forthcoming in Review Economic Studies that shows you how you can do sensitivity analysis for diff and diff. Those tools apply here directly in a similar fashion. Cool? So, all, so this is to show triple differences are very popular. They are in many places. And the heart of differences, the triple differences, it is that we now need to satisfy two criteria to actually be treated. Well, that allows us this kind of peculiarity of having to satisfy two criteria to be treated, allow us to change our assumptions and to allow us to kind of like, kind of like allow some types of shocks that was not allowed before, right? And by leveraging that, we can, we're gonna get triple difference estimators, right? We can still fit into regression. This is very easy to implement, no big deal, great stuff. Question is, still, we do have parallel trends, right? We still have to satisfy our parallel trends. So in that situation, what if I only believe in parallel trends after I, I have to condition on observed characteristics? I have to condition on pretreatment like characteristics, features X, right? What if parallel trends is only plausible after I condition on covariates. How can I do triple differences reliably with covariates? And don't tell me, get this regression, just throw coefficients over here and you're good to go because we know that that's not effectively right for even in the simple diff and diff two periods, adding covariates linearly, it's not the way to go because that strategy usually impose many other additional assumptions so we not want to do that, right? We want to allow for covariate specific trends and respect our assumptions as much as we can, right? So what are we going to do? We want to allow for covariates in triple differences. And this is where I, I was puzzled. I couldn't believe it. So I searched in the literature, triple differences, covariates. I searched and I searched and I searched and I didn't find it much out there. So because I didn't find it much out there, I said, well, you know what? This is an opportunity. Let me write it up. And what you guys want to see it now it is this first attempt of writing up what is out meal. What, I, what we did for the classical different diff setup, right? This type of like regression adjustments, IPW, and double bus procedures for triple difference with covariates, right? That I have not yet found in the literature. Just a disclaimer, a heads up, right? This idea of running two differences, two different diff and diff, right? One for treated states and one for untreated states, right? So yeah, this analogy completely breaks down if you have covariates. So that's what I found interesting because I, I didn't know that, right? So that this, this like analogy breaks down. So what I'm gonna I try to do now is to cover that case in detail with you guys to see how far we can go. Still, there is no software implementation for these things, but hopefully we're gonna be able to do that soon. So the idea is to close this gap. I haven't seen much discussion of triple differences with covariates. I don't understand why, because there are more than, like, many papers do triple differences, many papers use covariates, but in general it's kind of like quote unquote naively. So let's close this gap the same way as we have done it before. So in terms of assumptions, right? The assumptions we're gonna have to, in order to incorporate covariates, we're gonna follow the same philosophy as we have followed with diff and diff, right? Now you're gonna assume that the type of power of trends we're making only holds within each strata. It's gonna hold only after we condition on covariates. Right? So after I condition on covariates, I'm gonna have that the average of the, the difference of the average evolution of untreated potential outcomes among units in partition B and partition A in treated states is the same as the difference of the untreated 
potential outcome, and the evolution of unprinted potential outcome among units in unprinted states, so states S equals to infinity. Right? This is going to hold only after I condition on X. So we're going to allow for covariate specific trends right, in a very flexible manner, actually in a fully non-parametric manner in this identification results. Right? So we're going to make no functional form assumption. Everything here is fully flexible. Right? So we're going to say like within each covariate stratus, right, I have this type of triple difference part of trends. Make sense? We're not going to impose any restriction across the stratus. Right? So people who are, I don't know, highly educated, maybe very different from people who are lowly educated. So we're going to allow for education specific trends and we're not going to restrict how old, how high educated and low educated trends relate to each other. They can be, they each one, each of this group can have arbitrarily different evolution of untreated potential outcomes. Cool? Of course, once I have this conditional part of trends, just like we did in lecture four, we're gonna have a overlap condition, right? So the, our overlap condition looks different because now you're treated. In order, to, in order for you to be treated, you have to satisfy two criteria, right? So here you're gonna have three different criteria, three different subgroups, sub right? You have to S equals to infinity and belong to partition A, you belong to untreated states with partition B, or you belong to untreated states, or treated states with partition A. All these three different partitions over here, right? You are untreated, and I'm telling you, given a vector for observed characteristics X, there is a positive probability that you belong to each of these three partitions. So this is telling me units who were actually treated, they could have been in other subgroups. That's what this assumption is making, assuming, right, it's very similar to the other one as we had before. And this assumption is going to allow us to avoid to rely on extrapolation arguments, right? But again, we are making this strong overlap assumption to incorporate covariates in a fully non-parametric and flexible manner. Now, I have a conditional parallel trends here for triple differences. I have a strong overlap. I have no anticipation. How can I have leverage all that? We can leverage this exactly the same way as we have done for differences and differences, right? I can do an outcome regression approach. I can do an IPW approach and I can do a WBUS procedure, right? We can do this for panel data. We can do this for repeated cross-section. In these slides, I'm gonna do all this for balanced panel data because the notation is simpler, but just map these slides with those slides in lecture four and you're gonna see a lot of parallels. And that's the whole idea over here. So for simplicity and to make things concise, I'm gonna focus on balanced panel data. And to my knowledge, none of this, it is out there yet. I have not seen papers validating this procedure, which I think is a unique feature for all of you guys who are taking this course from us at Causal Solutions because we are pushing these things further as well. So you're probably one of the first people to have access to this type of material out there. First, we're gonna do it this three, regression adjustments, IPW, and W robust. Let's start with regressions, right? Because that's intuitively. So to leverage regressions, right? What are you gonna do? Our we're gonna follow, I'm gonna be slightly faster here because this lecture is getting much longer than what we anticipated, right? And because there is no much material out there just yet, and right? there is no formal paper, I'm gonna give you the formulas and the intuition of all these blocks. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to write to me. I'm happy to take questions. And all the steps we're gonna do here follows very closely the steps we have done for lecture four, right? So we're gonna combine our the insights we got from unconditional triple differences 
with the insights we got from conditional DID in lecture four, we merge the two, we get formulas for triple differences. Right, so the regression adjustment procedure, right, that we're gonna do it, it's very simple to incorporate covariates regularly. So the first phase of triple differences estimated for the ATT that allows for covariate specific trends has the following form. First, I, I, I have the evolution of the outcome from period post minus period pre. That's what I care about. So I compute this average among units who are actually exposed to treatment. Right, so S equals to two and L equals to, uh, and L equals to B. When these two criteria are satisfied, you are actually treated. So what I have here, it is the average evolution of the outcome among treated units. First component, check. What about the other component? Here, this component, I'm gonna have to like leverage information from untreated units, right? And impute this information to the treated subpopulation. So what I have here, here, in order for you to be untreated, I have three different partitions of the data that you can be untreated, right? You can be in treated states, but do not be logging the target population. So you have L equals to A. You can be in untreated states and belong to the population of targeted in other states, L equals to B. And you can be in the untreated states in population with L equals to A. So there are three different ways you can be untreated in triple differences. And what we're gonna have to do, we're gonna have to get one regression for each of these three types. And so this M function, it is the regression, the conditional expectation of the ever is the, it is of the evolution of the outcome, so period post minus period pre, given that you belong to this particular subgroup and given vector of values of covariance X. Right, so, I'm, so how I'm gonna leverage this formula? How I'm gonna use it in practice? In practice, I'm gonna slice my data into four subgroups. You are treated, S equals to two and L equals to B, or you are untreated. But if you are untreated, you can be in each one of these partitions, right? Now, within each of these partitions, I run a regression of the first difference of my outcome against covariance X. So I, I split my data into this, within each of these partitions, within each of the subgroups, I run a separate regression, one for each. I learn about the coefficient of this X among these partitions. Once I have learned the coefficient of X among these partitions, so it's like I have like coefficients that are like they are subgroup specific. I, I get those beta hats, right? And then I'm gonna get predictions, fitted values for this M's here. So I'm gonna have M hats everywhere, right? Using the covariates of everybody in the data. Then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this particular operation here. So one prediction minus the difference of predictions. And I'm gonna average this particular combination using only the covariates of X to the treated subpopulation. If I do this, right, I get the ATT, right? And this is gonna be reliable. We can actually establish, this is a fully non-parametric, like, estimate for the ATT, which is very interesting because here, what is clear, I can't split the data into treated states and untreated states and one, one DID with covariates for each and then subtract that. I can't do that. Why is that? Because in order to get an ATT, I have to integrate 
the covariate distribution here x using the information of the printed units. Right? So this information of the printed units, if I split the data into state s equals to 2 and state s equals to infinity, right? I'm not going in the states with s equals to infinity, I do, I'm not going to be integrating this covariate distribution according to the right subgroup. So that's going to be potentially not valid. And that's going to be problematic for us. Right? So under our assumptions, you cannot split the data into states equals to s equals to 2, states with s equals to infinity, run one different day for each, and then with covariates, they subtract one from another. This will not work under our assumptions. Right? So what is the right way to do it? This way here, right? which is essentially going to have to estimate three different regression models for different untreated partitions of the data, uh, different, three different subgroups of untreated observations, make this particular operation you have here, and then average these differences in predictions, this function of predictions, using only the covariate distribution of the treated units. This allows you to, do, like, to recover the ATT under the exact same assumptions as before, which I find it pretty cool, right? In practice, right, in order to trust this procedure, we're going to have to, this triple difference estimators, right, this outcome regression or regression adjusted triple difference estimators, we're going to rely on our ability to model this outcome evolution for these three groups. So I'm going to now, in the past, standard DID, I have to model a single regression only. Now I have to model three regressions. So it's going to be more demanding. And our estimator is going to require more assumptions about these model specifications. But if you're able to do that, we can incorporate covariates into the analysis and move forward. So that's the first phase this IPW, now the outcome regression. Now, what if I want to do more, right? What if I want to do IPW? Because I don't want to model the outcome evolution. I want to model the probability of belonging to the particular treatment group that I care. We can do that. We can definitely do that, right? And to do this, what are you going to have to do? You're going to build on the foundational work of Alberto Abadi in 2005, we're going to build on my previous work with Jun Zhao, right? And we're going to get triple difference estimators that are of the IPW format. And again, to actually make this work, we're going to, we're going to tell you there are four different partitions of the data. Partition 1, 2, 3, and 4. What is partition 1? Partition 1, if you, are, if you belong to unit I, belongs to untreated states and has L equals to A. Partition 2, you belong to untreated states and you have L equals to B. So you are part of the targeted population. Partition 3, you are in the treated states and you have L equals to A. So you are, the, you are not part of the target population in that state. Then partition 4, you are in treated states and have part and L equals to B. So partition of four here are the set of units who are actually treated. And partition one, two, and three are subset of units who are untreated in this application, in this triple difference setup. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna define propensity scores. So propensity scores, right, for different combinations of these partitions. So what is gonna be P? superscript A given X. So the idea here is like I'm going to have three different types of data set in my hands. I'm going to always keep treated units in my, in my data. So treated units are always going to be kept in my data. Why is that? Because if, they are, if I keep treated, since I care about ATT, I always going to keep them. So then what I'm going to do, I'm going to do like I'm going to always drop sub two subsets of untreated units and keep the other. So P, superscript A, X here, it is doing the following. 
it is the probability of belonging to the treated cohort, given covariates, and given that it belong to either the treated cohort or this partition A that I kept. So let's give an example. What is P1x? P1x, like I, I'm going to drop partition 2 and I'm going to drop partition 3. Since I have dropped partition 2 and partition two, 3, I have two groups only, either partition A, 1, or partition 4. So P1x is the probability of belonging to partition 4, given x, right? Given that I am in this subset of the data that I constructed. What about P2x? P2x, what I'm going to do? I'm going to drop partition 1. I'm going to drop partition 3. So I'm going to keep only partition 2 and partition 4. So again, two groups. One treated, one untreated. So what is P2x going to compute? I'm going to compute me the probability of belonging to the treated cohort, given that I have given x, observed characteristics, and given that I am in the data set that I did not drop, that I kept. Right, so that's the idea of this P superscript A given x. I'm essentially binarizing this for this, this multi-level decision. So I'm going to belong to partition A or partition 4. So given that I keep these two partitions only, what is the probability of belonging to partition 4 in this subset? That's the idea. And why I'm doing this? Because as I said before, I care about the ATT, so I always going to have to keep the treated units. But now I have three different types of comparison group that I can use. So triple difference estimators are going to leverage these three different types of comparison group that I can leverage. And that is revealed here in this IPW procedure, right? So IPW procedure, I'm going to have four different types of weights. The first weight here, it is a dummy variable if you belong to group, to the cohort four. Drink water here. So this is going to give me here, if you belong to the treated cohort, value one. If you do not belong to the treated cohort, value zero. That's the idea. What I have over here, right? If you belong to partition three, value one. If you belong to any other partition, value zero. So here, what I have is like, I'm going to weight these units with the probability of belonging to partition four given that I am either in partition 3 or partition 4, right? So this, this and this is going to be essentially like a DID, estim, IPW DID estimand if I drop all units from untreated states, dropping units for group partition 1, dropping units for partition 2, I'm going to do a diff and diff, an IPW diff and diff, only using units who are in state 2, and I'm going to partition A or partition B, right? So partition 3 or partition 4. This is this first DID estimate here, right? So this is essentially what I'm doing over here. Now, this is not valid. This does not have a cult interpretation under our triple differences conditional parallel training assumption. So we're not going to be able to do this. Right? So you should not trust. This does not have a count interpretation for the ATT. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to add more terms. Right? And then I'm going to have two other weighting schemes over here. Right? Depending on what other types of units I can use as a comparison group. I can use partition 2 as a comparison group or partition 1 is a comparison group. In fact, subtracting this, I'm going to have a, a different type of DID, this is a different type of weighting estimate here of compare, but let me, but I always keep this propensity scores here. I computed using data from 
partition 4 or partition 2 and partition 4 and partition 1. So this is by leveraging the same process as we have discussed in lecture 4, right? We can get IPW triple differences estimates following this formula. All our weights here are guaranteed to sum up to 1, right? If propensity scores are close to 1, right? These weights become unstable, but then the denominator, the normalizing weights, going to be unstable as well. And again, what are we going to do? We're going to fight fire with fire. That's the idea over here, right? This also going to give me valid inverse probability weighting estimates for the ATT in triple different setups. And again, this is not the same as splitting the data into two groups, right? States who are treated, states who are not treated. Compute an IPW for each of the subset of units, take the difference of them. This will not give me valid estimates like I have over here, right? So that procedure of the difference of two IPW DID estimates in general does not provide you a valid ATT under our assumptions. You have to add more assumptions to make that happen. Interesting, right? I never thought about that before. Very interesting for me. And again, how are we going to implement this in practice? Estimate these three different types of propensity scores you can. Once I estimate these different types of propensity score, right, I can plug the fitted value here and then I can use the analogy principle. Replace population expectations with simple analogs. Everything works greatly. And again, in order to reliably use this IPW adjusted triple difference estimators, it's going to rely us on our ability to model these propensity scores. Compared to the simple diff and diff IPW estimator, here we have to estimate three different propensity scores. Before it was only one. So again, this is more demanding, right? Which is interesting because to relax some assumptions, identification assumptions, right? We're going to strengthen our modeling assumptions. So this is interesting and you have to take that into account when moving forward. Well, we have regression adjustments. So we have outcome regression. We have IPW. We can combine them. We have done this before, lecture four. I have done this together with Jun Zhao in a paper. I have done this together with Bradley Calloway in a different paper, right? And here, and somehow I have never seen this done in triple differences. So here we are doing that exactly the same way. So we're going to combine IPW and we're going to combine outcome regressions such that as long as one of these families of models is right, I'm going to get the target estimate. So as long as one of these families of models is correct, I'm going to recover the ATT. So how our double robust estimate looks like? It's going to leverage the idea that in fact, I have to run three different estimates here. I'm going to have to run three and not two different difference and difference estimates. Right, the first one, it is I'm going to drop data from partition one and two. So partition one and two, remember, are partitions who belong to a state who do not pass the policy. So I'm going to drop untreated states, do a diff and diff, only among treated states. Apply the W robust formula for that. This is the first equation over here. Now, that is not enough. Our assumptions tells us that we cannot stop here because we want to allow more flexible evolution of untreated outcomes. So we still have other comparison groups we can use. So what, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back Right? Remember the partitions. Now I'm going to drop partition 1 and partition 3. I'm going to keep partition 4, which is the treated partition of the data. Right? And I'm going to keep partition 2, which is a unit who are belong to L equals to B. So belongs to the target population, but they happens to live in an untreated state. 
So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to do another definitive of treated versus untreated in cohort 2. I'm going to do a double robust definitive of this partition 4 minus partition 2. And that's exactly what I have here in the second term. I'm going to subtract this guy from this. So again, valid, I can do this. Well, why? Since I'm here, I can do another one. I can do a different double robust diff and diff using partition four, the treated cohort, and partition one. So what I'm gonna do, go back, drop partition two, drop partition three, and do a diff and diff, a double robust diff and diff of partition four minus partition one, right? And I'm gonna add it back. So minus and plus here, this is all coming from our parallel trend assumption and the triple differences. So once I do this, this particular combination of three different double robust BID gonna target, gonna deliver my ATT. And this is fascinating to me because this intuition that you should do two different DID only and take a difference of these two, it is not enough once you have covariates. In fact, you're gonna have to do three different DIDs, right, using different partitions. And once you do that, you're gonna have to like make the operations combine them together using this formula. This is gonna be less model independent than the outcome regression and the IPW, because as long as this model for the propensity score or this, so what are, what are we gonna have? We're gonna have W robust within each row, right? So as long as the P3 or this M3 here, it is valid, I'm gonna get this estimate here correct. So as long as this, this, this or this, P2 or M2, P1 or M1, so I can do this like W robust within each row. So I'm gonna have to require three conditions to be satisfied but I have more flexibility now to allow different models meet specifications. So this is gonna be less model independent and I believe this can have additional attractive features compared to the other ones. What is an open question at the moment for all of you who are more econometrics driven? It is what is the same parametric efficiency bound for triple differences? Right? I, I, I'm almost done with these derivations, right? but I mean essentially what is the best you can do without adding additional structure? Still don't know, we still have to cover this. Cool, but what is the main takeaway here in this simple case when I have two states, two set of states, treated states, untreated states, two partitions, partition A not affected by the policy, partition B affected by the policy, and two time periods before and after. Without covariates, this folklore that I can do diff and diff among treated states, diff and diff among untreated states, subtract one from another, gonna give me the ATT, that is valid. That's okay, that's gonna work. I still wanna leave only one parallel trend, so I should not interpret each of these separate DID causally, but that's gonna give me what I want. Once I add covariates, this Trinks breaks down, and it breaks down because I have to ensure that I'm integrating with respect to the covariates with respect to the right measure, right? The treated X, the, the, the covariates of X among treated units. So that's why you have different formulas, right? And you can do different things. You can add more structure, you can add more homogeneity assumptions about covariates right, to validate what you have done before her that's gonna add other over-identifying restrictions into the problem, and then you open a Pandora box. But in general, in order to make triple difference work with covariates, you're gonna have to run three different different diffs with covariates, not only two, and you're gonna have to aggregate these three differences, these three DID procedures correctly, right? And this is very visual and very intuitive with the double robust procedure. 
right? And that's what I should like emphasize here is that this is different of common practice and I quite like this results. I found it fascinating. Cool? You may be wondering, are we done? We are almost done, right? We are done with the classical case with two periods and two groups. But that's kind of like, instead this is all new. We haven't, we haven't seen any of these results before. But in practice, we can do more than that. We can keep pushing things forward, right? What happens if we have multiple periods? And good news for us, it is that if I have multiple periods, I can leverage all results from lecture five and six, right? And keep doing things exactly the same way. So first, what are we gonna do? We're gonna do the case when I have multiple time periods, but no variation treatment timing, right? Multiple periods and no variation treatment timing, it is good because it's exactly the same as difference and differences with several time periods, but no variation treatment timing. So let's tackle this case first. I have t time periods now, not t equals to one, t equals to two, I have t equals to one, two, three, four, five, six, capital T, right? Treatment now states adopt this policy in a given point in time, G. So G is gonna be the time the policy is enacted, right? So all time periods before G, so from one until G minus one, you are untreated. From period G until capital T, you are potentially treated. Why are you potentially treated? Because now it's gonna, be, it's gonna depend if you belong to a state in which actually passed this law in period G, I'm gonna call this states little s equals to little g, treated states, or if you belong to states who do not pass this law, you're gonna have states equals to infinity. Right, so states which, which the time of the law is equal to infinity. So they, are, they remain untreated until the end of the time period. Now, this would be sufficient to talk about the difference and differences. But remember, we are in a triple difference environment. What it makes a triple difference? I have to satisfy an additional criteria to actually be treated. Right, so here what I'm gonna have, I'm still gonna keep this two partition criteria, right? You either belong to part to L equals to A, which were unaffected by the policy, or you belong to L equals to B, which you are affected by the policy if you are in a state which passed this law. Right, so again, units in partition, L equals to B. In states with S equals to little g, they're exposed to treatment. They have G equals to little g. Everybody else gonna have remain untreated, they have g equals to infinity. Make sense? So in order, in order for you to be treated, in order, in order for you to have capital G equals to little g, right, you have to belong to states which pass the law in period g, which is the only time treatment can be, the law is actually passed in this setup, simple setup, and I have to, start, I have to belong to this partition, right? which is L equals to B. Cool? So same thing as before, but now I have more time periods, right? I just increase the number of periods. So now that I have many time periods, we're gonna be able to talk about dynamics, right? We're gonna be able to talk about the average treatment effect in different points in time. And we have already implemented, introduced this type of parameters in our discussion in lecture one, in lecture six, in lecture seven, in lecture eight, right? We had already talked a lot about this five as well. We know how to leverage these insights. So here we're gonna talk about, we're gonna introduce this group and time specific treatment effects. So group here, remember, it is defined by the time the policy is enacted, right? So little, little g. So the ATTGT, it is the average treatment effect among units who are treated for the first time period G, right? And the effect here is the effect of being never treated, switching treatment time from never 
to treatment time equals to little g. Right, so the average treatment effect among units treated at time little g at time t. But who is treated in time little g? Well, you are only treated in period little g if you belong to a state in which has passed this law in period g and you are part of the population that is targeted by the law, right, which is L equals to B. So A, T, T, G, T, so we can drop the G in the conditioning set, right, and talk about S and L in the conditioning set. This is fine, same thing here, just to be able to be, so we can express our terminology here of stutter DID with this triple difference setup. Cool? Of course, we can also, I mean, we can, we're going to be able to estimate, identify and estimate these ATTGTs for different points in time. Here, I have a single cohort because treatment happens in a single point in time. So little g is fixed, right? And I'm only going to be able to vary time. So I'm going to be able to talk about event studies. We're going to be able to aggregate this by treatment dynamics to get the more aggregate parameter. And again, all this discussion, we are borrowing from lecture five. We have talked about this in great detail over there. What is going on over here? Right, you may wonder. So how we actually move from two periods to several periods in the ID? Well, we just strengthen in parallel trends to hold not only from period two, but now it's gonna hold for every post-treatment period, right? And here we're gonna do exactly the same. We're gonna assume that our triple difference type of parallel trends holds not only in period two, but holds for any post-treatment period. Same content, of course, to talk about long run effects, this assumption gonna be stronger, right? So if I am close to little g, this assumption is mild. If I am talking about long run effects, this assumption is getting stronger and stronger, right? The further away I am from treatment date, the harder it is to identify treatment effects, so the harder it is to believe in this triple difference parallel trends. Still, it's formal, we can check it, we can discuss it, we cannot directly test it, but at least we have better intuition to move forward. So once we have this, right, following the same steps as we have done in lecture five, and the same steps we have done here in between slides 18 and slide 24, we can get a triple difference estimates for this ATTGTs, and all you have to do it is to replace short differences from period two to, and period one to long differences from period T to period G minus one. This is exact same insights as we have done in lecture five, right? Exact same insights we like uncover in our course. All we have to do it is to take long differences and apply this idea of, of recursive substitution by leveraging our parallel trends. Once we have this formula, we know how to play the game. We know how to move forward, replace population expectations by sample analogs, right? Just do DID by hand. And here, because we do not have covariates, right? You can do the strategy that is commonly advocated in the literature. You split the data into two groups. Either you treat it, states were treated, S equals to G, states were untreated, S equals to infinity. Do a diff and diff, do an event study, like for each of these two groups separately, you cannot interpret these two groups separately as causal under our assumptions, right? So what are you gonna do to attach a causal interpretation? You're gonna subtract this event study plots, coefficients, to, like, you subtract that from the event study coefficients among treated states, and that gonna have a causal interpretation that's going to give me the ATTGTs that I am after. Very simple, you can leverage how to do inference here, right? So here I have a step-by-step -step on how to do this implementation, right? Split the data into two groups, L equals to B, L equals to A, disjoint. 
among those units we have Alex, Alex Osway. Do I DID for the periods that you care? Event study coefficient from the periods that you care. Do the same thing now for the group with L equals to B, right? And different, and, uh, an alternative kind of event study coefficient. Do that as well. Now, so we track one from another, right? That's going to give me the point estimates that I care. This is good. So we're tracking these two different event study coefficients, going to give me the point estimate that I'm after, right? Which is going to give me an estimator, an estimate for this ATTGTs and the triple differences. Now, I'm not done because I need standard errors. I need confidence intervals. How can I do that? Well, you can leverage the influence function, right? You can leverage the fact that these partitions are disjoint, right? And you can do bootstrap for that. So yeah, I'm gonna have to do this by hand. Don't worry, I have prepared a template file on how to do this in R for you, right? I, I made these things available in the members area. So I have a step-by-step -step guide on how you can do all this different six step implementation using the bootstrap and all that so you can actually be comfortable moving forward, right? So to get inference right, it's important to stack the influence functions, right, with the right sign and bootstrap the influence functions. And I have shown you, I have provided this in the members area for the causal solutions like course, right, where we have templates on how to do this. Should be easy, well documented, a lot of step by steps there, good to go. Cool. Now, we are in this world with several time periods, but two set of states only. We can incorporate covariates exactly in the same way as we have done in lecture five. Right here, I'm going to illustrate how incorporate covariates in the analysis. Right? And essentially, we're going to make the same assumptions as before. Right? That now our dynamic part of trends of our multi-period triple difference part of trends going to hold only after you condition on a vector of, obs of observables. Also, we're going to make the same assumptions as before. We're going to have strong overlap. And once I have these two assumptions, we can come up with IPW estimators, outcome regression estimators, and we can also come up with W robust estimators. I'm going to cover only the W robust ones just because I like them better. Right? And again, the W robust estimators, it is very similar from before, from the case when I have only two time periods. The only difference that I have to make it is that now I'm going to take long differences. And so I'm going to model, I'm going to take the outcome in period C. So we track that outcome. So we track the outcome in period G minus one, which is my latest pretreatment period, right? This regression M here are all depending on time period C as well. So that there are long differences in this regression, but it's exactly the same insight as we have done in the past in the two by two case, right? I'm gonna have three different types of W robust DID. I, ha I cannot interpret each of these separately as causal under our assumptions. So I'm gonna have to do one by one separately, combine them, then this combination gonna give me an estimator for the ATT. That's the gist. That's how we allow for several time periods. We don't have software to do this yet, right? Because these this partitions here are not disjoint, right? So because these partitions here in the data, they're not disjoint, by merging these influence functions, you have to be more careful. So we, do not, we don't have software yet to implement triple differences, W robust with several time periods available yet. Even with two periods, there is nothing, but I'm hoping to tackle this issue in the near future. Finally, to close this chapter on triple differences, to actually be fully comprehensive, do everything that is possible that is out there that we have covered in the course, we have to talk about staggered adoption, right? And staggered adoption here is not so complicated. Because essentially, how does this setup changes compared to difference and differences? So here is staggered adoption. 
is going to be now. I'm going to have not only the two set of states, I'm going to have several set of states and each set of these states pass this policy in different points in time, right? So I'm going to have several time periods before I have only two set of states, either you're treated in period G or you're never treated. Now I'm going to allow states to pass this loss in different points in time, in different years, if you may. And within each of these states, this policy is targeted for the same population. So I still have two partitions over there. In each state, you either belong to partition A or partition B. But you can already see, if you pay attention to lecture 7 and 8 of the main course, that having several states here, it is analogous or having several groups in the classical case. And how are we going to move forward? We're going to translate this staggered adoption setup with triple differences to something we already know how to do it, which is the case in which I have two periods, no, several periods and two groups only. So we're going to talk about group specific ATTGTs again, right? We're going to have to be careful who are my comparison groups, right? And we're going to leverage the same intuition. So we're going to build on lecture seven and eight, especially lecture eight of the main course, right? To develop triple differences with this target adoption. Right, so again, states now, this index S, is going to play the role of our groups, but you are only treated if you fulfill at time period G, if you fulfill two criteria. You have to belong to a state that passed the law for the first time of this treatment in period little G, and you have to belong to the partition of units which this policy is targeted, L equals to B. Right, so I'm going to have capital G equals to little g, if and only if you belong to a state which passed the policy in period G, and you belong to this targeted subpopulation L equals to B. Once we have this, we can build on lecture 8, we can build in Carlo and Santana, and we can do triple differences exactly like before, right? Our assumptions, I have here detailed step-by-step -step procedures on how you can leverage this. You're going to make an anticipation. You're going to have to make a sequence of triple differences, of triple differences parallel trends, right? Here you can use the never treated states as your comparison group, or you can use the not yet treated states as your comparison group. You can do this. You have the same choice as before. I have here the formulations. They mirror the formulations in lecture eight. So I'm going to be a bit faster here because this lecture is getting very long. So once we have this, right, if I do not have uh, covariates, it is straightforward. Again, we can split the data into two groups, cohort G, that you care, states in which pass the law in period G, states who have never passed the law. I have these two groups, I do one DID for the states which passed the law for the first time in period G. I do another DID for the never treated states. I subtract one from another. I get my estimates for the ATTGT. This is if I use the never treated units as a comparison group. Now, if I want to use the not yet treated units as a comparison group, I can do this. I can do something that is similar. So I'm going to get the data. Still, I'm going to split it in two groups states which passed the law for the first time period G, and states who have not yet passed the law as of time T. Do a DID among states who which has passed the law in period S, in period G. Another one for which states, among states who have not yet passed the law, subtract one from another, I get my estimate for these 80 digits. This is all valid and this work well if I do not have covariates. How I implement this? Again, I have here the algorithm, and I do provide a template, an R file, an R script that implements all of this for you in the members area of the course. So this procedure, when I do not have any covariates, is very straightforward. I can do this, and I can move on. Now, what if I want to do covariates? 
again, the same discussion is going to apply, right? I can get the same stuff. It's like, it's more of the same. I can do triple differences with conditional parallel trends using never treated states comparison. I can do the same using not yet treated states as a comparison group. And I can combine Carlo and Santana. I can combine Vector 8 with what I have here then discussed. And I'm going to get this horrendous formula, right? Which I'm going to combine now, not only two different diff and diff, but I'm going to have three types of difference and differences, right? And depending on the comparison group we're going to use. And once I have that, I can do these things fairly well. Again, there is no yet software implementation for doing this difference, triple differences with covariates, right? But hopefully, we're going to cover that soon. So all this is to talk about ATTGTs. We can also construct summary measures, aggregations, like in Carlo and Santana. Right? Remember, each ATTGT is a building block. I can stick them together. Right? I can glue them the way I want. And we can do all these aggregation schemes we have discussed in lecture eight of the course. And if you don't remember, check the slides and also take a look at Carlo and Santana to discuss this more. Those steps go on here without any changes because once I have the ATTGTs, I'm done. Everything you have done over there applies directly, right? Because the building, once I have the estimate for the building block, the aggregation schemes is more of the same. Cool. So to wrap it up, I think we are done. We have done a lot here. Triple differences in great detail. What I want you guys to remember is that triple differences is very popular. It's in many places, right? And the key thing to apply the triple differences, it is that you have to satisfy two different criteria to actually be treated. In a world where covariates play no role, it's very easy and simple to push this forward because then triple differences become the difference of two DIDs. With covariates, right, this relationship kind of breaks down, right? So you have to be more careful on how to handle covariates with triple differences. And everything we have done with diff and diff, we can do as well with triple differences. We can cover the case without covariates, with two periods and two groups. We can cover the case with covariates. We can case the, the multi-period case. We can cover the stagger case. And I mean, we can talk about clustering. So all the insights we have done in the rest of the course, we can apply to this triple differences and get a lot of things done. I'm hoping to release a paper detailing and formalizing a lot of these details very soon, but you guys got the gist, right? The formulas are on the slides and we can actually make this happen in a reliable manner. Cool. That's all I want to say. I hope you guys enjoy and if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Thank you guys.